And you're watching Paul Court Morning Channel! Welcome to the CrossbowExpert.com show. I'm Chris Larson. Today I've got a guest here. It's Paul Korn from Tombstone Creek Bow Hunting and the, the Paul Korn Bow Hunting Channel as well. You can see this guy all over the place. And what we're going to do is try to bring Paul on once in a while here just to kind of share some of his knowledge with us. And today we're going to be talking kind of a hot button issue. This is uh, one of these things that people love to argue about is broadheads. It's a dicey situation, and, and you being an outfitter get to see a lot of it, where a lot of people come into camp and, and maybe they've been to another outfitter and they ask, oh, you can't shoot that broadhead, that broadhead's junk. Tell me about broadheads. A lot of people will tell you this one's crap, this one's great. Are they crap, are they great? What, where is the truth? Boy, like you said, that is this is one that we can go on for hours about debating from a lot of different angles. I guess there's a couple different schools of thought or a couple different different philosophies that I have on broadheads. And number one, accuracy and shot placement are the number one most important things. Bow hunting is bow hunting and things happen, things go bad. And and so as far as, you know, what is that mixture or what is the combination of things that makes you feel comfortable? I mean there's just some people that'll say, you know, I I will not shoot a retractable because it takes energy to open them. I mean, although, you know, some of the later generation retractable heads, you know, are rear deploying and they, they seem to penetrate nicely, there's people that just don't want to use them and, and don't believe them. And, and, you know, and quite honestly, if you don't have confidence in something, that's the, the number one thing. I've, <laughs> you know, being in the archery for 29 years now, I, I've had so many conversations on broadheads and then and it seems like it's, it's interesting too because you'll have somebody that'll come in and they'll have you know I shoot this particular head I've shot my last eight deer with it I've everyone I've shot it's killed them they, they don't go anywhere they shoot so good and then the next year they'll come into the shop I'm looking to switch broadheads because they shot a deer and they didn't recover it and then you know you start digging into it well it was you know it was quartering to me a little bit and I caught the shoulder and it's like well you know you you're kind of chasing your tail around, I think, sometimes. I mean, you know, things happen, but, you know, the, the perfect broadhead for the perfect situation, the way that I've come up with it in my head, and this might sound really maybe a little bit ridiculous, but if you could pick the broadhead after the shot, then I could tell you which one mm -hmm. would be the best one to use. Because, you know, like down in Missouri, somebody will come back and they'll, and they'll be like, oh, I hit a nice buck. Okay, well, where did you hit it? Well, I'm back a little bit. I think I'm liver guts. Well, then I wish they had about a three-inch cut because they're not going through any heavy bone. They're going through the middle of the deer, through all the soft tissue, and I just, I want a really big hole. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they came back and said, I hit it right in the shoulder and the arrow went in just a little bit, uh, you know, it went in four or five inches, and you're like, man, I wish they had, you know, a slick trick or a muzzy or something that's just, you know, smaller diameter that will really penetrate good. But... Unfortunately, you know, I know, and everybody knows you can't pick the broadhead, you know, after the shot. You have to do it before the shot. So what is the right mixture of something that's going to fly good and yet penetrate and be accurate? And, you know, the, the, the debate goes on and on and on and on, and on you know, and, and, and I really think that the new retractables with the rear-deploying blades give you that combination of, you know, the bows are really, the bows keep getting faster. And so fixed heads are a little bit harder to tune. If, 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 if I, I do shoot fixed heads, I normally shoot a retractable, especially for, I say, for caribou sized animals on down, I prefer retractables. Um, for, uh, from, you know, on up from there, like when I moose hunt, when I elk hunt, I prefer a fixed head. Mm -hmm. And, but even though my fixed heads are very small, like I shot a, a, a giraffe a few years ago with a, uh, Rocket Ultimate Steel, which was a 7 8 inch cut broadhead. But my thinking there is, is it's got real sh stiff, thick blades and, um, and it's small diameter, so I can push it through more stuff as opposed mm -hmm. to pushing a, you know, like if you take like an inch and a half fixed broadhead, they, they fly terrible. And I mean, people can tell you that, oh no, I, they shoot fine. Well, when you really get into a, a simulated hunting situation, they really don't. I mean, if you get into a little bit of crosswind and you get into, you know, even even going through grass, and I, I uh, always tell people that, you know, when I was in my early 20s, from my early 20s till my mid-20s, I literally shot tournaments every weekend. 
And I remember there's a, a broadhead shoot down in in uh, Nacita, Wisconsin. The Wisconsin bow hunters put it on, and we have you know Dana Keller brings a group of people down there every year. I used to go shoot that broadhead tournament, and I remember I went down there and, and I shot an entire season, and I really felt like every shot that I made would have killed an animal if, of course, they wouldn't have ducked or something, you know. But I mean, I hit everything where there every shot for the whole year is deadly. I go to this broadhead shoot, and I literally fixed up 15 broadheads. It was a 30 target shoot, so each one I was going to shoot twice. Because, you know, you take a broadhead on something and you take it out, you know, you got wings on the front of the arrow. It's like, I'm going to shoot each one twice. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to that shoot and I ended up missing three targets. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And they were close. I mean, they, they move them in a little bit. And I'm like, well, and I remember thinking to myself, if I could shoot a field point at, at every animal, I think I'd kill everything I shot at. Right. But unfortunately, you know, that's, you can't do that. Well, then that's what got me looking at retractables early on. And I'd buy them and I'd shoot them into plywood and they'd blow up. And I'm like, geez. And I just found the best ones that I could. And I started using them for, you know, for, you know several. I mean, I think I started shooting retractables like in the early 90s, back when every article you read about them was taboo. You know, they're going to ruin the sport and they're going to do all this and that or whatever. But then on the bigger animals I used fixed up. But I just noticed I was more accurate. And I could put the arrow where I wanted it to go. So... You know, that's kind of, you know, like the overview of what I'm looking at. So it's like if you can be more accurate and maybe you give up a little bit of penetration, is that better or be less accurate? And if you do hit, make a bad shot or you don't, the arrow doesn't quite go where you want it to go, will it penetrate better? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of really the, you know, really the kind of the give and take of the whole, you know, retractable versus fixed yep. situation. And they've come a long way from when you started shooting them in the mm -hmm. 90s to now, mm -hmm. they're very, very dependable. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's pretty much all I've ever shot. Yeah. But like you say, I don't, you know, I've never gone elk hunting or anything like that, but if I was gonna go elk hunting, I probably would go with a fix, like you mm -hmm. say, just to get that penetration mm -hmm. on a big animal like that. But I think one of the things that, especially for our audience, since we're talking crossbows, you know, you're talking about a lot of speed. Right. So right. back in the early 90s when you were shooting compound bows and you're probably shooting 250 feet per second. Yeah, yeah that'd be a fast one. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to now we're shooting <coughs> crossbows 400 plus. Yeah. And you start yeah. putting, you know, an, even an inch and a quarter fixed blade on the front of that thing. If the ferrule's a big, long, goofy looking ferrule, things just not going to shoot right. And you talked a little bit about tuning as well. You know, with your compound bow, you can do some things with that to, to make that broadhead shoot. Mm -hmm. With the crossbow, you know, we can play around with the arrows, but that's really about yeah, it. Yeah, you're, you're very limited to what you can do. And, and you know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And my dad, that's all he shoots, and he has very good luck with it. But he's got, he's got a lot of energy, a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, penetration potential with what that thing puts out. He calls it torque. I laugh at him. He goes, man, this thing's got a lot of torque. Yeah. Some people will say, okay, even though you have that, I hear a lot about the deflection. People say, well, you know, as the blades are opening, they deflect easier than a fixed head. And I just plain flat out don't agree with that. Because I tell you, going back to, you know, me starting to bow hunt in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, I'm telling you what, man, Rocky Mountain Supremes, those big, if you don't think those things deflect when they hit something, you catch a, a, a rudder sticking out there, I think they all deflect. But, you know, if you're looking for a reason, if you dig hard enough, I would rather have the person focus on what can I do to get, make a better shot. Mm -hmm. And then, but I mean, I, boy, I tell you, they work good. They work good for, you get, you know, you, you take a hundred and, you know, a crossbow that's shooting 360, 300, 400 foot per second, and you put that, you know, retractable on there, it's nice and accurate. The, you know, it's a short bolt, it's, it flies good, and it penetrates good. And they, I mean, they work great. Mm -hmm. That's something your your partner at A1 Archery, I've I've gone to some of his broadhead seminars because I think he puts a really good one on it. Mm -hmm. He always talks about this is Dan Ellison, kind of the four things that you should look at when you're looking at a broadhead. One's going to be accuracy. The other one's going to be penetration. Mm -hmm. The other one is hemorrhage. That's how we're killing things with arrows is hemorrhage. The other one is blood trail. Yeah. So you look at your broadhead and you look at those four things and what's most important to you. So if you go with the retractable, let's say we go with a two-blade NAP kill zone. That's the one that we probably recommend to more people shooting right. 400 feet per second crossbows than anything. Just right. because 
We've shot them through paper at 30 yards. We've seen that they stay close so they hit the, hit the and target. And they're truly mechanical. You don't have any collars Correct. or rubber. Yep. Yeah. No rings, no collars. Truly mechanical system. Super duper accurate and just super sharp blades. Yep. We love that broadhead. Yep. And, and what it does, uh, and those four things we look at, you've, you've got super, you've got great accuracy. The penetration, you're not going to get a penetration out of that that you would out of like a bolt cutter by Excalibur. It's mm -hmm. an inch and a sixteenth, 150 grains. Yeah. But still, if you're shooting out of a crossbow, like you said, it's 400 feet per second. We're going to get penetration just because we have so much power coming out of the bow. Then we're looking at hemorrhage. We've got a two-inch hole that we're putting into the animal. And the other thing is going to be our blood trail. And this is something that we talk about a lot with our customers at Crossbow Expert is with that two-inch blade, and this is another thing that Dan Ellison showed me. If you take a sheet of paper and you cut a two-inch slit in that sheet of paper and pull on the corners, what happens is it just it opens up super easy. Right. And when you shoot an animal with that two-blade two broadhead, you shoot that deer and it takes off running, that hole just grows right. and grows and grows. And when you find them, I mean, you can stick your arm in them, a lot okay. of them. I mean, well, and just, that's like the, the first Rage commercials that came out that really got the ball rolling for them. I don't know if you remember them, but it was just like... But yep. that was a two blade, big yep. slit, and you, know, you get the right orientation, it just opens that skin right up and, yep. and leaves a massive blood trail. Yep. And one of the things that I talk about with, with customers that call in, we take those four things that we're looking for in a broadhead. If people are looking for a broadhead for turkey hunting, then our blood trail isn't as important just because they just don't bleed like deer do. Yep. Yep. So what we're looking for there is more hemorrhage. Yep. So. I still like that same NAP system, that same true mechanical system, but we recommend that Spitfire just because instead of two blades, you're getting three blades. If you take that paper test I was just talking about, the two inch slit, and then you make the same shaped hole that that three blade will and pull on the corners, it doesn't pull apart it as doesn't, easy. No, no, it's so, I remember T-Bone Turner used to always have, do you want a slit or you want a T3 chunk? The T3 chunk is that three blade. Yeah. And, it, and it's true that when that broadhead goes through the animal, that three blade hole is going to look bigger, but that two blade hole just grows faster. And that's why we like the it two blade. Typically it puts more blood on the ground. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when you're hunting whitetails or any type of animal like that, antelope, that you want blood, we really like the two blade. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when people, a lot of times at Tombstone Creek, people call me and they'll ask me, what broadhead do you recommend? Or, And I'll say, well, really the most important thing is what are you using and are you confident with it? And mm -hmm. if they say they're, you know, they're shooting a slick trick and, I, and I, yes, I feel confident, I've, you know, or I'm shooting a rage hypodermic uh, or I'm shooting, you know, NAP. I mean, the number one thing is that you feel confident with it, but it's amazing how quickly that confidence just erodes into, I don't even want to look at these things anymore as soon as something goes bad. So I, I, honestly, you have to be really realistic when you look at this. I mean, I, and I, I firmly believe that um, sometimes even a perfect shot is not good enough. I mean, you, you can be a very seasoned, experienced hunter and you're reading body language, you know, like for instance, a deer comes walking by and meh, you stop him and hurt and you know, oh, hey, I just put that deer on a high alert. I'm going to aim a little bit lower because he's going to react a little bit more to, you know, to the, to the environment, to this situation because he just heard this, you know, noise. And so you aim a little bit lower and you, you maybe aim too low and he doesn't duck or she doesn't, the deer doesn't duck and now you're too low. So you don't know, you, you use your, you know, your experience and your best judgment and quite honestly we've learned like watching video that you know what you think happened and what really happened is usually so totally different you know I mean I'll be running the camera on someone and I'll be like man you should have let it stop well I did no I was still walking it was slowing down mm -hmm. and and uh, and you shot and then they don't then you watch the footage and, and I've been surprised I'm like matter of fact I shot a turkey this spring that Al filmed, and in my mind, it came into the decoy, and I'm like, I'm waiting for the right angle, and it really, it took three seconds, and it seemed to me like a half a minute. I mean, it really seemed like a long time. When I'm watching the, the playback, I'm like, wow, I mean, I made a good shot, and I did everything right, but things are a lot different, and, and I'll tell you, penetration being so important with a retractable, if people come into the shop and they say, man, I get a pass through every time, I can almost guarantee you that they're patient enough that they let the animal stop. If the animal's moving a little bit, 
it will, it's kind of, the way I like to, to describe it is, you know, when you come down and you're shooting, you know, it's easier for the front end to follow the back end of the arrow if you're shooting a stationary target. If they're moving a little bit, basically when that arrow hits, you pull, you pull the front end over a little bit and you, you lose your, you know, the back end pushing through the front of the arrow. And then, you know, and I've had people say, I never get a pass through. I will almost guarantee it with all the filming that I've done and, and what I've seen, if you don't get a pass through, they're, if they... If you can think back to the last time you shot a deer and you literally had to go pull the arrow out of the dirt, it was in the it went through the deer and it stuck that far into the ground, I will guarantee you, you think back, that thing was standing there perfectly still. Now, look what that does to your penetration, as opposed to shooting them while they're walking. It's it's amazing the difference it makes. So there's more than just the broadhead. You know, there's the tuning of the arrow, making sure you go down to A1, have your bow tuned correctly, and you wait for a shot where the animal is stationary. That's kind of like my giraffe when I shot it. It's like, he, I, this thing, I need, I'm shooting, you know, like something that has no space, or very little between its rib cage. I know I'm going to be blowing through bone, so I want a heavy arrow, a fast arrow, I want it flying perfect, I want a small broad head, and I want the animal perfectly still, and then that all worked. But there's still a lot, a lot of things that can go wrong, even if you try to do everything right. Yeah, that's something that... So we've been talking a little bit about the difference between fixed and mechanicals and what the advantages are. But another question we get too is, should I shoot 100 grain? Should I shoot 125? And one of the most popular broadheads we have at crossbowexpert.com is going to be that 150 grain bolt cutter. Mm -hmm. So what, are, what kind of things can people expect to see in difference when they shoot anywhere from 100 to 150 grain? What's the advantage of shooting lighter compared to heavier? Well, you know what? I. I'll let you speak for the crossbows. Uh, you know, for for compound bows, the arrows are even like you know you get your carbon express arrows that are front over center or whatever, and you're trying to get that front over center to be like close to the double digit marks. Uh, and so everything is really you know the arrows are really set up for 100 grains, mm -hmm. which I think are for deer size animals are very adequate. And I think 100 grains is I mean field tips or practice points are readily available. Uh, the arrows are really spined and balanced, you know, for that particular weight. So I, I really like that. Now, when you go into the crossbows, of course, you've got, once again, you've got more power and you've got, you know, you're going to change your trajectory, so you obviously have to practice when you, you know, when you, if you're shooting, you know, 100 grain field points and you go to 150 grain broadhead, you're going to have to practice. And of course, your dials and stuff are going to be off because mm -hmm. it's going to slow down quicker. It's going to change your trajectory. But I think, obviously, there's some advantages. And I'm sure, you know, you talking to customers every day, there's going to be advantages, you know, in penetration and, and, uh, and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So you go to that 150 grain, especially, I mean, there's not a lot of broadheads out there in 150 grain. Mm -hmm. NAP had their 170 mechanical um, that they came out with that I don't think took off really the way they they had hoped it would. One of the issues was it was a three inch cut and they just couldn't get into some, some states you just can't use a three inch cut. Yep. But that Excalibur 150 grain broadhead is really the, the heaviest broadhead that's out there you know, on the mainstream market. There's guys that make heavier ones in their garage, but as far as the mainstream broadhead, it's kind of the heaviest one that we have. And for guys who like fixed heads, that thing really flies well. And I think a lot of it is due to, one, it's designed for crossbow. So a lot of the fixed heads that we're seeing out there, you know, a lot of guys call us to say, hey, I've been using Muzzy for years. Well, those Muzzies, a lot of them were designed back when we were shooting 250 feet per second right, bows. Right. If you put that on a 400 feet per second crossbow, it's, it's going to look like a sidewinder coming out of it. So this broadhead was designed for, for crossbows. It's got a nice tight ferrule. Inch and, a, inch and a sixteenth, so you don't have a whole lot of blade out there, and it's heavy, so it shoots really well. But I personally, I like to shoot the 125s, and I like a mechanical. I use the kill zone for deer, I use the Spitfire for turkey, and what that does is it's going to give you more penetration, and I think it's going to give you better accuracy. It just gives you a little more weight on the front of that arrow, and when you're shooting compound bowls, you know, you're shooting an arrow like this, we're shooting a crossbow, we're shooting an arrow like yeah, this. Pulled, so yeah. having, having that weight up front is a nice help. But like you say, if you're going to be a guy that maybe you're going to go to Wyoming deer hunting, well, if you're going to shoot a 125 grain broadhead, before you go out to Wyoming, you better go buy two or three packs because Joe's hardware in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, probably yeah. isn't going to have a yeah. 125 grain broadhead. 
Whereas if you're shooting a hundred grain rage, yeah. you know, just about every you can go into any any bait shop that yeah. has a, you know if they have three packs of broadheads on the shelf, they'll probably you you can find stuff. You can usually yep. drive a short yep. any little town that's got anything and be able to find something. Right. You know? So that's one thing to think of is that I like the 125, but if I'm going to go somewhere that's out of the way, right. you know, you better plan ahead. Because a lot of guys, you know, well, you know, I only need three arrows, so that's all I right. shoot at home. Well, <laughs> until you go out and miss your first three shots, and yeah. then you don't have yeah. any, any more broadheads. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, and you, you brought it up as well, is most bows are not going to come with, and you, you buy the package, you're not going to come with 125 grain field points. So if you want to shoot the 125s, you got to make sure you get 125 grain field points. If you do order from crossbowexpert.com, you order your crossbow and and you just put in the notes. This is one of the big advantages from getting it, your bow from us compared to a box store. If you say, hey, I want, I'm going to shoot 125 grain um, broadheads out of my bowl. Can you swap the field points out? We can do that for you. Just put it in the checkout notes and we'll make sure that that gets done for you. So just make sure that you're shooting the same field point, the same weight as your broadheads. Because if they're not the same weight, they're not going to fly the same. Exactly. So that's, yeah. that's kind of the, the big thing to, to keep an eye on there. So we talked really a lot about the broadheads as far as what you like for the size of game compared to, you know, if we're shooting caribou or smaller to elk moose, you like the fixed head. Um, anything else that, that really comes to mind when, when you're thinking about what broadheads people should be shooting? Well, we, I don't think we've talked very much or at all about it, but I think anytime you're ever talking about broadheads, you've got to talk about sharpness which is the number one most important thing, regardless of which one. I mean, you can have the best combination of something that flies, gets to the spot, opens, or doesn't open, depending on, you know, retractable or fixed, but sharpness. And, and don't take it for granted. I, I mean, we've got burned on that before where, you know, we're, we're having trouble, and all of a sudden you start taking brand new broadheads out of the package, and they're not sharp. So, and I'm sure if we don't mention it, there'll be com people will comment on that. But it, the broadheads have to be sharp. I mean, shaving sharp should be able to cut the hair off, or very, you know, just pull a stretch a rubber band out, and it just touches it, and it and it blows the rubber band up. Making sure they're sharp, because that's it. And and then the other thing is that, you know, I had uh, uh, previously I had you know people in camp come and uh, and say, hey, can I take a shot? At, can I shoot a broadhead into your target? Because it's a little bit harder on your target. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I would really like you to do that. And I watched somebody take two shots and then go pull the broadheads out and stick them in their quiver. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, they're brand new. No, they're not. They're, they're not. They're, they're, they're junk now. Yep. Well, I shot them one time. They're junk. Yep. I mean, one time you take the edge off them, you're trying to, you know, and I always tell people, like, when you're shaving and you cut yourself and you're like, you, you, you cut it, you don't even feel it. And you look in the mirror, you look in the mirror, you look in the mirror, and all of a sudden, bleh, the gush is out because, you know, because of that fine, beautiful little cut. It's not a tear. It's a true cut. And then now you can't stop it. you got toilet paper watered up on your face or whatever. You take a dull razor and cut yourself, and it, it you know, it just comes back together. It, you know, it's, it's harder to, you know, you get that nice, clean, perfect cut with a perfect, you know, broadhead. But still, I think... We assume that people should know that, mm -hmm. but it, it's very, very, it's the most important thing, seriously, because I don't care, you think you got the best broadhead ever, if you shot it into the target four times and then take and go hunting with it, you do not have the best broadhead ever. That, that I'll argue, I mean, I, yeah. I, I get the, you know, people being confident, and we've had, I remember Jim Obermuller, who, who retired from A1, he said one time a guy came in after season returned a pack of broadheads, and it was sitting on the counter, and he didn't get a chance to put it back on the shelf, well, we returned them because... He was, I think it was a retractable, and he was going to a fixed or whatever, and he never even got it back on the shelf, and somebody came in and returned a fixed and traded it for the retractable, and he never even got back on the shelf. So it's like people are, I mean, I, I, would, just, I would just warn people to really look at the big picture. I mean, are you using it as an excuse because you took a shot in low light or at a bad angle or... You know, and you're trying to compensate for that because you'll chase your tail around. You'll never get anywhere on it. And uh, so that, that's the big thing. Really look at it. I mean, you know, people take, I mean, I've had people, you know, like deflect off a branch and hit a deer in the neck and don't get it. And don't, not like a broadhead. Mm -hmm. It's like, how can you, I mean, you, you can't blame the broadhead on that. You know, I mean, you, unless you're shooting a fixed and you think you could have maybe, maybe you, you know, you would have not hit the branch, then maybe that's a reason to go to retractable because it will help your accuracy and, and, and uh, the last thing that I 
really have to say on it is a story that I've told a million times, and you know, people that know me personally probably heard me tell the story. But I remember um, back in the old shop before we had it, actually two shops ago before we had an indoor range, we used to go down, and my wife and I ran the leagues at the Hudson Rod and Gun Club, and uh, we would go down there and we would set up uh, the sand back when everybody shot retractable heads. We'd go down there and we'd put the sand up and they'd put the paper targets up or whatever and we were down there shooting all the time. I mean we I mean we were down there basically in the summertime every day. We shot leagues up there and stuff like that and we switch over to broadheads and people would be coming in and they'd be sighting their broadheads in. And of course they'd they'd take their um, you know their muzzy one twenty or their their uh, Thunderhead one twenty fives back then and Zwickies were popular and you know there was uh, you know there's you know you had your your, your, your certain kind of like go-to broadheads and it's funny because you'd watch they'd screw them on there and they'd put them together and then their first groups were you know not like field points but they were they were not bad or whatever and then as they shot they'd shoot into the target and they'd they'd bend them up a little bit I remember like when Thunderhead went to the aluminum ferrules after four or five shots they'd bend mm -hmm. well now the groups kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then I'd be down there all the time constantly and people would be it would be the biggest panic before hunting season. I'm going elk hunting and my broad heads fly terrible. And then they bring them in and you spin them and they're like, they're terrible, you know. So then you line them all up and they get, you know, then that was better. But but what I remember the most about it was whenever somebody would be shooting, they, you'd watch them and they'd shoot into the target and, wow, nice shot, great shot. You know, and then they'd shoot another one, wow, that's that good, that went right there, that's a good shot. And the next one would just go wild. You know, like they'd miss by a foot. And then I would say, oh, what happened? And you know what, it'd always be the same answer. Oh, that was me. Oh, what did you do? I flinched. That was me. I'm like, well, okay, so of the three shots that you just took, which one do you think you're gonna do, is going to be the closest to you're going to duplicate when there's a big buck standing underneath your tree where you're moving, you didn't get stopped, you punched the trigger, and all that stuff, all the, all the emotions that go through at the moment of truth. Which one? Well, probably that one. Okay, well, I tell you what, if you put a field point on there, all of a sudden now your group goes like that, even though you're you get excited now you're tight so let's you know put a retractable head on there and you know try to be accurate mm -hmm. but I mean people would just be you know like you make a mistake with those and 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 punch the trigger and you get wings on the front of that arrow and you get it flying they just fly wild you know like mm -hmm. I swear sometimes they could clear a basketball they're making a big enough hoop you know they could yep. you could trick shoot it around a basketball you can't do that with a field point so that's where I really felt like retractable heads and accuracy are a big one. And, and I remember when I first met Will Primos, that was a, a debate that we would have all the time. You know, I'd be like, what do you want? I mean, you got to pick one. Do you want to be, because there's no way that you can tell me you're hunting elk and you got a 52 yard shot and it's, you know, there's a 13 or 23 mile an hour crosswind and you're winded, you're breathing hard, and the elk's down there bugling. I, I know which one you're going to be more accurate with. What do you feel comfortable with doing, you know? Mm -hmm. and I think one of the other things you, you touched on there that I want to make a point of them. We always talk with the customers too. Is we have a lot of people that want to buy replacement blades. Mm -hmm. The manufacturers make the replacement blades, and you certainly can buy them. But this is the way I look at it. And let's say you pay forty-five dollars for your three-pack of broadheads, so you're fifteen bucks a broadhead in. You go and buy the blades for twenty dollars for enough to do a three-pack, so you're seven dollars to buy the blades to replace the blades. So right. you're, you're looking at about half price on those broadheads. So you're saving eight bucks, but you're gonna have to do the work to, yeah. to replace those blades. But listen, we've got thousands of dollars in our quads and our trucks to get there. And if we go to an outfitter, we got money into our hunt. If we don't, we got money in our just our hunting property. We got money in our bow, we got money in our clothes. And we're trying to save $8 on, and like you say, when you start shooting those those broadheads through targets, you start shooting that broadhead through an animal. You know, if I shoot a deer with that broadhead, it, it's more than likely it, it hits some bone. Mm -hmm. And I may not be able to tell that there's a bend in that ferrule, but there probably is, mm -hmm. just because I, I hit bone. So, of all the thousands of dollars and the probably hundreds of hours we have wrapped up into our hunt, do we want to save eight dollars? <clears throat> or would we rather be 100% confident and know right. that at least we gave our, like you say, things can happen. Even yeah. if I put brand new blades or brand new broadheads on, things can still happen. But I'd rather 
spend that eight dollars and get a brand new broadhead, know that I did everything I could. Cheap make, insurance, right? <laughs> cheap insurance. Yeah. So in my mind, replacing blades on a broadhead's a really bad idea. Right. I mean, and there's some. I mean, if you are the kind of person that wants to mess around with that, and you have an arrow spinner, and you have you know, the stuff to do it or whatever. I mean, there's, I mean, you can most certainly do that. But most people, I mean, I think, honestly, I don't even know how much we sell. I don't think we sell hardly any replacement blades. You occasionally do, but, um, I, you know, most people look at them as a throwaway item. Yeah. And But if you want to, I mean, you can, but I, I don't, and we don't, you know. I mean, we just yeah. go on with new ones, you know. Too many, too many things there, yeah. too many variables that can go wrong that... It's just easy and not right. to have to worry about right. that variable. So yep. that's that's kind of. I can tell you when I was in Africa, I, I shot. Uh, we were there in 2015, and I, and it was very interesting because I've been to Africa many times, and the first time I went was in 1996, and they didn't know what a, a retractable was. Then a few years later, they're like, "No, them are you. We don't allow them." Mm -hmm. And so I, I get there in 2015, and they're like, "What broadhead? How broad, broadhead are you using?" And I'm like, "I'm rage." And the, and the guy goes, "Hypodermic." And I said, yes, oh, thank God. You know, it's like, I'm like, but he knows, right? Well, I shot my first couple of animals and I threw them in the little garbage. And he's like, what do you do? Why are you throwing them away? I'm like, well, I, I use them one time. He's like, well, over there, that is like throwing gold in the, I mean, you can't, I mean, a pack of Rage Broadheads, by the time they shit, I mean, they're just ridiculous. They're probably spending $100 for Broadhead. Well, mm -hmm. it's like, you know what, here's what I'll do. I'll bring you some blades the next time I come, and you can have my old ones, and you can take the time. I mean, if it's going to cost you $100 a Broadhead, you know, then, okay, I now, that makes sense. Yeah. But, but and, oh, they were tickled pink, you know, I... You know, they're like, they wanted me to shoot every... There's a guinea fowl. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> And if, if you're going to shoot them through a target or something and, and you want to keep the blades, because like you yeah. said, shooting them through the targets, like you say, just a couple shots going to dull yeah. those I blades. would I would, if one shot into a target, one shot, and you can feel it, and they'll say, well, it feels sharp. Yeah. Well, if, you know, I'm not a betting man. Usually I'm not a gambler, but I will, ga I will tell you, if you shot it one time into the sharp target, it is not as sharp the second time. Yeah. So whatever that is, I don't know if the scale is 1 to 100 and now it's 99. Yeah. I want them 100. You know, I everything wants. To, I want everything per, as good as I can get it. Yeah. Well, it was good talking to Paul from Tombstone Creek Outfitting. Thanks for joining us on the CrossbowExpert.com show, and we'll talk to you next time.